Okay. Thank everyone for coming out tonight. Nice to see a crowd. The, the neat thing is, they're always up here wondering which one are they angry with. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we want to welcome all of you. Appreciate this opportunity for uh, uh, you to observe the Board of Education. And uh, we're going to uh, have Jeff Barnett, an Air Force veteran, lead us in the place. So if you please stand up, baby. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Motion to approve the agenda. Second. Second. Any discussion on the motion? I will just recognize that uh, Mr. Martin will have to recuse himself. On 6.4 under the consent agenda. Okay, all those in favor of approval of the agenda signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. I appear to have it. I do have to prepare the motion to adopt. Mrs. Adams. Good evening, board members and guests. I'm so excited to present our ACE Award this evening. Our honoree tonight is a phenomenal lady. She is humble kind and would do anything for her students and her colleague. In fact, she thinks that she is here tonight to support a colleague with getting this award. But surprise, tonight we are here to honor her, Mrs. Valerie Kearns. <laughs> an outstanding educator who always puts her students' best interests first. On top of teaching three grade levels, all five subject areas, Mrs. Kearns teaches her students <laughs> life skills that they will use each and every day. She focuses on eating appropriately in the cafeteria, on appropriate relationships with friends, and with problem solving. Valerie attends dances and extracurricular activities to allow her students these experiences in, a new, in, in new environments where she's also there to assist them if it's needed. Valerie always keeps her eye on the main thing, which is her students and maximizing them to their highest potential. She is truly deserving of being honored as a caring educator. I would like to read you what her aide, Ms. Dawn Buzzard, uh, says about Valerie. Most days, teachers teach from a textbook, but every day Mrs. Kearns teaches from her heart. She doesn't teach just reading, writing, math, social studies, and science. Mrs. Kearns also teaches life lessons and life skills. She is so full of kindness and compassion, from showing up at her <laughs> students' concerts, to paying for dance tickets, to rushing a coworker to the ER during a medical emergency, <laughs> to just today taking a coworker home after hearing of a de devastating loss. Valerie goes far above and beyond as a teacher, colleague, and a friend. Her students are like plants. Her dedication, knowledge, and passion for teaching is like a watering can. She pours all she has into her students each day. Mrs. Kern's students often enter her classroom as shy, timid sixth graders but leave as self-confident, self-loving eighth graders ready to take on high school. Valerie Kearns is the epitome of a caring educator. Her students and coworkers are infinitely blessed to have the opportunity to work with her. So Valerie, thank you for your heart. We are blessed to have you here at HMS. So this is for you, it says a caring educator, March 2023, Valerie Kearns. <laughs> Mrs. Kearns, I had a pleasure to speak with Ms. Adams today, um, had a long conversation about your history with uh, Pennsylvania Middle School, 
And this is my third year up here. I don't think I've seen this many friends supporters for um, fellow colleagues. Of the I wouldn't work anywhere else. I mean, I I love working with them and all of them. And I I love the opportunity to work with county schools has given me and to work with the kids that I work with. Yeah. Thank you. We, we appreciate your work and myself and the rest of the board. Congratulations on being our ACE recipient. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we going to try to see it? Are y'all not getting in? Do you all get in? No, not everybody has to go to the back. Some people can go <laughs> 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 Come on, get up here. I want to be Especially Dawn. <laughs> 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 All right, big cheese is HMS. Big group. It is a good group. All right, one, two, three. And on three, you're all going to do something crazy. <laughs> two, three. <laughs> The next part of the meeting is Citizens Forum. There are four policy states uh, that we will allow each citizen who signed up. I have three people signed up plus one gave me a message to read. So we'll have four citizens uh, speaking tonight. And we have to always warn the audience first, you'll have three minutes. Uh, uh, and uh, we do not allow any derogatory comments, profanity, inappropriate comments, and or referencing an employee or student by name. And if so, then I have to ask you to uh, yield the microphone and, and return to your seat. 
We also want to warn that any slanderous or libel comments are at the speaker's peril and uh, subject to legal recourse by anyone who crosses the line uh, saying something slanderous about an individual, employee, citizen, or student. So with those read, trying to wait till it kind of quiets down a bit. Where do I go? Right here at the podium. Uh, if your time runs out, I'll indicate for you to uh, kind of wrap it up in a sentence or two. And you'll have three minutes, and I have a time of light meter here, if you can see it. Go right ahead, sir. <clears throat> My name is Derek Gallagher. I've been teaching at Martinsburg High School for 13 years, and I love it. I wouldn't want to teach anywhere else uh, because of the combination of administrative support, positive faculty members, and a diverse student body that's open to new experiences and challenges. All that being said, there are a number of issues that person have with the direction we are headed as a school, as a district, and as a state. Speaking of state, West Virginia has the highest obesity rate and diabetes rate in the country. Since I started Martinsburg High School in 2010, 2011, the state's diabetes rate has increased 33%, a rate higher than any other state in the union. During this time, we have continued to provide students with food and drink that are scientifically proven to increase rates of diabetes and obesity. The sheer amount of sugar that students drink during the day is enough to make them lethargic. And that is before we add all the processed carbohydrates that accompany almost every meal especially uh, prevalent breakfast, most egregiously in the form of donuts. Juice has long been debunked as a health food because of the amount of sugar it contains without fiber. It creates the same blood sugar mm -hmm. as does soda. Soda has multiple corrosive layers of, uh, of health implications, and there are soda machines being put into schools. Students get 11 grams of added sugar from chocolate milk and 17 grams of sugar from juice two times a day. That's 56 grams of added sugar a day. That's 180 days in a school year. That's, two, uh, that's 20 pounds of sugar just from drinks. These health issues facing our state are relatively new and the problems are only worsening. Teenage obesity rates in West Virginia in 1999 were 14%. National average in 1970 was 5%. 30% of our teens in West Virginia are obese and 40% of our adults. West Virginia is the number one state in the country for hypertension, which is 43% of the adults. 16% uh, of our state is diabetic. We are genuinely concerned about the physical and financial health of our children. This would be alarming. The average cost of care for a diabetic in West Virginia is $6,700 a year. We as schools do not control the entire food environment for our students, and there are plenty of factors beyond our control. But we can make efforts to move in the right direction, and a small step would be to remove the option of chocolate milk and juice and provide the students with water to drink. Besides food, another research-based approach that would change student health and wellness is movement. Exercise has a profound impact on brain and balances key neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine that prime the brain to learn. Exercise literally creates new neurons in the hippocampal region of the brain, which is a structure where long-term memory storage and retrieval occur. Exercise aids in sleep, memory, and focus. And in clinical, trial, uh, clinical trials, exercise is a, as effective as Zoloft, but truly shines as a preventative measure against depression. We as a school district and state should be very aware of protocols that can mitigate depression and anxiety because 31% of our high school students are battling these issues. Teachers have to complete suicide training every year and we never discuss how to use, utilize exercise as a tool to alleviate the pressure that students are under. I'm gonna skip some of this research, but I have some really good research for you guys to check out on that. Um, In schools, we do not prioritize movement, we prioritize technology. I have never been in my 13 years to professional development training that mentioned any of the studies I have on here uh, that you know I'll give you guys, but uh, any of the studies I have on here about exercise and its relationship with learning. But I've been to countless trainings on smart boards, Movies, iPads, Schoology, and Telespark, Chromebooks, Nearpod, and countless of other products and applications that have since fallen out of fashion. These technologies are not free and we are currently spending more money per pupil than we have in the history of our state. And what are the results? Test scores are continually going down as health markers get worse. We've been prioritizing technology so long without any market improvements in student performance and health, yet we don't bat an eye at the high cost that the tech requires. Mm -hmm. The cost-benefit analysis would turn the stomach of any reasonable businessman. We can't afford to view exercise as a cherry on top. It should be viewed as a core part of what makes us human and allows us to thrive in a changing world. Uh, you know, another thing I have on here is about uh, spending time outside. 
Students spend the majority of their time inside. Much of that is on technology that we are being pushed to use as teachers. Outside of school, kids are on technology that they're being pushed to use as, as kids. This adds up to, according to the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, on average, nine hours a day of screen time. This is an issue once we see all the research and data that supports the importance of spending time outside. Going outside uh, exposes us to a full spectrum of light that regulates melatonin. Uh, you don't need to get the gummies. Just go ahead and go outside, especially in the morning, according to, according to Stanford neurologist and ophthalmologist Andrew Huberman. Time outside regulates your sleep cycle and produces vitamin D. Vitamin D is a key hormone that aids in sleep, has important immunological benefits, and has been linked to other mental health benefits. Spending time outside reduces anxiety. Okay, I'll get this. Uh, basically, uh, our kids deserve better. Um, we're failing them in so many different ways, and I'm challenging this board to, at the very least, create an advisory group um, to, to inform the board of concrete strategies that could be implemented uh, without burden to administrators, teachers, and students that could move us in the right direction towards some health and wellness markers because it's really bad. Are, are you speaking on behalf of yourself or the faculty senate? Or? I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of myself because I think that, you okay. know, even, even in my school, I, I feel like a lot of teachers wouldn't agree with what I'm saying. Okay. Thank you. We are. Sorry. Martin for us. Thank you. Mr. President. Uh, he had, I gave him four minutes and I'll give the other speakers the same. Could, could we ask the speaker if he could send us the information that you have? I have it right here. I have what, what you yes, If you would leave it with um, uh, Ms. Mayo yeah. in the back. Yeah. Or email to the board, whichever you like. To it's handwritten. I prefer to give it to you guys. Okay. Ms. Manuel's in the back corner. You can get it. Sure. Don Butcher, representing the professional educators. Yeah, um, Don Butcher with West Virginia Professional Educators. And the purpose of my being here this evening is related to your ransomware attack, which happened back in February the 3rd. We've had numbers of contacts from members of our association who are also your teachers with concerns about the fact that they have they don't, they have not heard much feedback from the administration on this. They feel kind of in the dark in terms of what has happened or what is happening. They don't know when they're going to, you know, get their access back. They're concerned also about uh, their personal, uh, their personal information, which is on your systems. And they just, you know, a lot of questions, which they just, don't feel like they're getting much information back on them. Basically, what they're being told is that by the administration is giving them as much information as they can based on legal advice that you're getting, which I do understand. We do understand. Uh, I guess the purpose of my being here this evening is to um, plead with you to give as much consideration to your employees as far as any information that you can give them that you may not have given them, um, protecting their personal uh, information on the systems, um, and if possible, give them some indication as to when they will have access to the teaching tools that they're used to having access to. Um, so I understand that it, this, this is a new thing for anybody at this point, and unfortunately, you are kind of the guinea pigs with this situation, and uh, I'm very sorry what what has happened uh, to Berkeley County Schools. It shouldn't happen to anybody, uh, uh, and I think that's as much as I need to say. We do. I am trying to set up an appointment with your superintendent to get some more direct information from him. Um, I understand that he isn't able to be here this evening for a pretty good reason that he has one of his um, children that are playing in um, a competition at the university level. So thank you for, for giving me the, the time to speak to you on this issue. Where did you drive from to be here? What's that? Where did you come from to be here? Uh, Harrisonburg, Virginia is where I live. Okay, well, we appreciate the effort you've made and the message you've shared with us. And, uh, this Dr. Schooley here has been taking notes and, and the senior staff will be talking about this more as they've been in the past. Okay. All right, your point is well taken, sir. Thank, Thank you me. very much. Thank you.
Um, uh, Mr. Mitchell, or Ms. Mitchell. Um, okay, I'm Casey Mitchell. I came here to talk initially. Well, I want to piggyback off of you because you didn't get your time. And as a, I was a psych major at UC Davis and nutrition and exercise minor. And um, what you said struck a chord with me, and I have big concerns about it. The first month of school, my middle child gained like 10 pounds. And I mean, I don't have control of what he eats at school, so I had to have big talks with him. But um, the food factor, the nutrition factor in school, that's, I, I'm right on board with that. And there is a big, um, uh, gut and brain chemistry balance, like the gut health has a big effect on how your brain is responding. And so just uh, to validate what he's saying, I absolutely agree. And I think that a lot of time and energy needs to be spent on that versus tablets and technology as well. Not that we have, need to not do that, but um, there's a lot of validity to what he said. Anyway, that's not what I'm here to talk about, but I absolutely appreciate what you came here to speak on. Um, my point is, uh, so we're supposed to supposedly have a new community come in um, in Martinsburg, just south of Harlan Run, east of Federal Hill, and north of um, Apple Knolls. And it's supposed to be 457 double wide mobile homes, whatever, um, which I, I don't care what it is that comes in. It's not like I feel like my community is anything spectacular, but mm -hmm. um, the point is it's, it's prefabricated homes that are going to come in very quickly, very rapidly, very close together. Um, you know, over 450 homes on 100 acres. And right now we don't have the infrastructure. And there are other facets that I can speak of about the infrastructure, but the main point here, obviously because of the Board of Education, is that um, there's not, there's already not adequate busing. I don't know. Um, who gets the text messages in the morning that uh, what buses aren't going to run because um, what if, so there's not a driver for them or um, some of the buses are overcrowded. I know that uh, just within the past few years, our bus had three to a seat, sometimes four to a seat, which is not acceptable. Uh, they did change that a couple of years back and added another bus to our neighborhood, but um, I just don't know how they think that if we already don't have enough drivers, how um, we're going to be able to accommodate 457 new houses going in. Um, and then there's also often a lunch staff shortage. And because of that, they often have to go to using styrofoam trays and plasticware, which is another expenditure as well as it's crazy wasteful. Um, but you know, that's literally one person out, the dishes can't be done. And so if we're adding more people um, and we don't have the staff to uh, the staff to accommodate um, all of these students coming in, in one district, one not just one district, but in one area of the schools um, that are already, you know, I think, uh, I can't remember for sure, but two of the Hedgesville schools were over, are over capacity. And then the other two are almost at capacity. And, um, you know, even if we just average one kid per household, which isn't what the average is, uh, that's an incredible amount to be adding. And uh, I know that uh, at Eagle School, which is where two of my kids attend, we already do not have adequate administration. Um, I don't know, I think we're on our like fourth interim uh, principal and vice principal or something. I can't even count. I don't know who the principals are at this point, and that's not usually my MO. Um, that's my four minutes, I guess. So, um, but there, finally, the last thing is we don't have enough subs to accommodate. Currently, my, uh, one of my kids' teachers is out on long-term sickness, and nobody can sub for him, so his team is supporting him. And that's, uh, you know, that's an extra 30 kids for that to be divided, but um, so my piece in four minutes. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. The last person is Julie Abel. She's unable to attend. Excuse me, sir. 
I, I signed up with Ms. Manuel. Uh, I emailed, yeah, I emailed you yesterday about this breaking story. Oh, okay, sure. I did. Yeah, I apologize. No problem. <laughs> Unless you want to read what you got first. If you okay. Could, please. Thank you very much. And your last name first. Is it Mattioli? It's Kim Mattioli. M A T T I O L I. Put on my old lady glasses here. Okay. First, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Um, again, my name is Kim Mattioli. Um, my son, my niece, and my nephew are all graduates of the Berkeley County School System. My time as a parent in our district has also netted me an enormous amount of great friendships with several current and former teachers, administrative staff members, administrators in leadership roles within the school system. So I am very keenly aware of the challenges currently being faced by the alarming rise of population here in Berkeley County, coupled with severely diminished staffing resources. Um, I'm here specifically to speak about the proposal that Ms. Mitchell spoke about with another 457 homes developed along Welltown School Road and the impact that this development added to the already developed Red Hill, Dillon Farms, Butler's Bridge subdivisions, all going in the Hedgesville School District. <laughs> Now, as a taxpayer with no children left in the school system, I recently voted for the recent bond and levy because I understand that this is crucial to the long-term well-being of our community. My son's freshman year at Hedgesville High School was the last year before Spring Mills High School opened. So I remember how challenging the overcrowding was for both students and teachers. And I now fear that the money that we have just voted um, will merely be a band-aid essentially on top of a hemorrhaging wound. Um, I took the time to read your comprehensive educational facilities plan from 2019. The population in that plan for our county by 2025 was projected to be just over 128,000 people. And according to the most recent census data, that population in Berkeley County in 2021 is up to 126,000 people. Our population growth is outpacing all projections that study anticipated that Hedgesville High School would be at 111% capacity, Hedgesville Middle at 119% capacity, and Tomahawk at 142% capacity by 2030. The, conduct, uh, the, the company that conducted that study specifically stated the growth curve that you're looking at is a serious issue and stated that one of the biggest concerns is that capacity won't be able to keep up with growth. And they went on to say, that their recommendation would be redistricting to help balance enrollment. The study also indicated that the rise in the over 60 population, of which I am closing in on, by the way, would cause concerns and issues for future bond and levy issues. Now, look, I work for the federal government. I understand bureaucracy. I know that the Board of Education does not have any direct say in the affairs of the Planning Commission or vice versa or any of the applications that the Planning Commission gets, but I do know that both groups have the ability and the common sense to come together for the betterment of our children and our community and work in concert with one another to come up with a plan that will help to slow the growth until schools can catch up. <clears throat> you, all of you, have a voice in this county, a big voice. You're on the Board of Education. You wow. owe it to yourselves to lobby the county to listen to you and take the challenges that you're facing into consideration in their master growth plan. You have to be the voice for these children and the families of this county. And I implore of you to please consider taking that opportunity, meeting with the Berkeley County Council, meeting with the Berkeley County Planning Commission, meeting with the different infrastructure boards and come together as a county officials and make your voice heard. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll point out that uh, under a monitoring item, we're going to be talking about the planning commission requiring discussion. The uh, gentleman sitting up on the far right, my right, right here. Joe, huh. raise your hand. I didn't see much of the speaking. <laughs> but he will he will be having a discussion here in a, about a half hour about that. Okay. Are we allowed to stay and participate oh, yes, in that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank I don't know about how much okay. participation, but uh, because I put it on the agenda, I anticipated maybe us asking you all some questions. So okay. We spoke to that item on the agenda. Okay. Finally, uh, a teacher, Julie Abel, called me tonight, said she couldn't make it, but gave me some comments to uh, share on the record. 
as citizen form, and I think I'm within doing this. I will time myself. My yeah. thoughts are not organized. I'll just turn the chart down as she was uh, writing. First, she, she felt that uh, we they need more time to work. The teachers, with the uh, earlier comments about the uh, schoolology, the computers, they're not they're not able to do the work. They're, it's having to be done at home on their time. There, as earlier speakers have talked about, there's shortage of substitutes. The teachers are working, covering for each other, and uh, it's 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 killing. Uh, uh, it's, it's extreme frustration. Julia was saying she hoped that she could make it. That her original goal was to make four more years so that she could retire. Now she's worried whether she can make four more months before the end of the year is going on. The staff is exhausted. There's no time allowed for them to meet the requirements that they're having to do. Grades are due. They can't read their IEPs. The lack of the internet, and uh, some of them don't have the internet at home, and they're expected to take the work home, and it's just impossible to get done. There are required uh, deadlines, which with without uh, with schoolology and they're not able to meet that. Um, she said the recent law change on PEIA is just icing on the cake. A lot of, a lot of hang in there. Um, she's ready to quit. Um, I, I uh, interject this personal thought here. I'm not worried about the employees walking out. I'm, walk I'm more worried about them walking away and not returning. Um, they need help with time. She asked that uh, the board and the senior administration try to find time as shortly as next week so that they have time to have a work day so they can get the work done. It's eating away at their uh, personal lives, their family lives, because they have to take it home. And it's, it's just no time. She recognizes they're paid for coverage, but she says the, the money is not worth the stress it's taking upon them. Overtime is killing them, she said. The frustration level, I think, I've already mentioned. She said, good people are done, done doing the job. So uh, the short-term request that she had was they need a work day. Uh, they had two hours, but it's just not enough. The time that they're working 10, 11 o'clock at night, getting up early in the morning, it's just, it's just wearing them out, the stress. So... Uh, I think I covered everything. That was Julie Abel, teacher at Mountain Ridge uh, Middle. Wonderful art teacher. And uh, finally, she said, are you all listening to me? Yeah. Okay. That concludes our parts of the uh, Citizens Forum. Did I miss anyone? Thank you all for sharing your candid and honest thoughts. We will now to consent agenda, uh, you're welcome to stay. Um, but uh, if, if you want to leave, you you can do so at any time. We have on the consent agenda one item that we're going to vote on all the items except for six point four. Yeah. Okay. Do I have a motion to um, approve the uh, passage of the consent agenda? So moved. Okay, mess was second. Okay, okay. Well, you're right. Okay, all those in fact, is there discussion or questions on any of the items from the consent agenda? I'd like to point out our treasurer's here and he's gonna leave early for a very good reason. He has expecting his first grandchild tonight. Sorry if I've embarrassed you by there, Mr. Butts, but I know how happy you are. Okay. All those in favor of all the items except for 6.4, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. I appear to have it. I have to declare it uh, passed. Now we will address the situation of 6.4 curricular and extracurricular trip requests. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Moved and second. Uh, all those in discussion, all those in, uh, in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. But I was pretty happy as you have a motion pass. We're now going to take a uh, probably a half hour. Would you say, Mr. Bill? It's up to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
we have to go into executive session to discuss uh, property purchase. So you all are free to relax, and uh, we're going to uh, retire to the back room. If we're being too loud, somebody knocking the door because it's, it's to be in copies. Do so I have a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing property? So that he and Mr. Martin have made a motion. All those in favor, motion signify the same. Aye. Those nay. I ask having a motion passed. Mr. Pill will be going into executive session and along with Dr. Stewart and Mr. Burton and Mr. Burns. Court has come out of the executive session at uh, seven fifty-five. Uh, well, then I think it's seven twenty-five. So we appreciate your all ready for this. I will recognize Miss Long for the purpose of a motion. And the motion is as follows: Authorize the superintendent to uh, execute a purchase and sale agreement, sign a deed, and any other appropriate documents as may be necessary for the purchase. Of certain property located in the Falling Waters District, Berkeley County, West Virginia, containing approximately 36 acres as identified in executive session at the price of $2 million. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Okay, is the discussion on the motion? All right. Uh, we want to thank Mr. Pill for working with the staff. Uh, we're locating land for. Uh, uh, future schools, which was uh, identified in the school bond, which we passed in as a primary election. Of the third, 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 third. And we want to thank uh, Mr. Burton uh, for also working on that process. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor of the purchase of the land, I mean, the, the agreement as read by Ms. Long, uh, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, those nay. The eyes appear to have it. The eyes do have it. Made a motion to adopt it unanimously. Ms. Lasky. After this, we'll be talking about the Planning Commission inquiry that we raised earlier. Ms. Lasky. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Murphy, Board of Education members. Um, I am Alaska, the Mathematics Instructional Specialist for Berkeley County Schools. And I'm happy, I'm happy to be here tonight to share with you the work we are doing in the schools to increase student achievement. And then I will begin with some data and the growth we are seeing and ensure the support that we have in place for um, with our academic coaches, our technology integration specialists, our math interventionists, and finally share the professional development that is taking place after the school day ends at all programmatic levels. So I want to start, if I do this button right, I mean, my friend Sharon Collins at Collins. Do you think that? This one, right? So I guess we're going to have to share the, the love. I don't like the clicker. This clicker works or it doesn't work? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> right? It works. It worked <laughs> before I got in here. Now it's not working. We could work together, Sharon. It's frozen. <laughs> All right. Now you're one ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Um, the first thing I want to show you, this is a graph that Robin Lopez, the Director of, of Assessment and Accountability, shared with you at the beginning of the school year. So this is data you've already seen. And this is our um, data showing that we are lagging behind at the state in the West Virginia General Summative Assessment. But I want to flip to the next graph that shares the comparison. Is it working? That shares that this is the growth that shows that in the math, in math, we are making gains between the 21 and the 22 school year on the general summative assessment, you will see that we are making some great gains in grades third through um, eighth. We are we are struggling in 11th grade with the older students, but especially I wanted to point out between third and fifth grade, we made some growth and sixth grade had a great jump in one year. Um, so we are seeing some increases in our summative assessment data. There we go. All right. So, at each school level, the academic coaches, the TISSs, and the math interventionists are invaluable and have a direct impact on our teachers and students in our schools. Um, with the academic coaches, 
All of the academic coaches have received professional development and math recovery assessments and instructional strategies. I've spoken to you on a few occasions about the positive impact that this math recovery training is having in our schools. And by having this training, our coaches have now been able to um, work directly with their teachers to address the gaps in their buildings and the personalized professional development in their schools. At, at each academic coach's monthly meeting, I meet with them to share resources, provide updates, collaborate, and answer any questions they have. Uh, the academic coaches and I have established an open line of communication and built a relationship so they know they can contact me at any time, and I'm here to help their school and their teachers. The next group that I work with directly a lot are our technology integration specialists. Um, again, I collaborate with them based on their school needs and I help them facilitate their school professional development on platforms such as um, IXL. In the secondary math level, we do a lot of collaboration on Desmos, which is a student platform that has kids collaborating and problem solving. Um, we work a lot on some online manipulatives that they can share with their schools. Um, and then again, we have a constant communication between myself and the TISs, whatever they need for their school building. And finally, oh, and the other thing I meant to, I want to promote the elementary TISs. We spend a large amount of time looking at data and figuring out what are the gaps in math. And from these gaps, we built some online activities for the kids to do in their school. Um, they built this great month of uh, math for February where every day they were supposed to do a math challenge, but unfortunately due to the uh, network, um, we have to push that back hopefully in the next couple months. But they again are helping with the um, needs of math in their schools. And then finally, the math interventionist. And we I've been working with them for a couple of years. And again, at previous board meetings, I've talked about the success they've had with their math recovery training, the growth we've seen in their buildings. So again, they're all trained, we keep them updated. We meet quarterly with them to look at their data and again, answer their questions, share strategies. We've built a great resource on Schoology for them to use with their teachers, um, with activities and games, online, hands-on and online games to use with their um, teachers in their building. Um, we, we all know that we are struggling to find certified math teachers for our county. Um, we, about three years ago, established a secondary math cohort for long-term substitutes. We were lucky for two years to have Debbie Sanders be my um, secondary aim, and she retired again. Um, so we, I know she's enjoying retirement. So we have been lucky enough to have Janice Stenson, who just retired from Hedgesville High School, and she was our Teacher of the Year in 2018, fill Debbie's role. So Jana is now um, working with our long-term subs, being in their classrooms. So I wanted to give you some data to show that this cohort of ours is really working. So in grades six to 12, we do have about 20 long-term substitutes, right? But as you can see from my little table there, our, our long-term subs are staking around, right? And the longer they're with us, the more we can work with them and build their capacity and make their classrooms effective and then thus working with our students. So and 10 of them are new for us this year, but we have five um, long-term subs that have been with, a, with us for two years. So we've been able to work with them for two years. One of them is in their third year and four of our long-term subs have been with us for over five years working with them. Um, other good news to say is out of those 20, five of them are actively pursuing certification. I saw one the other day, he took his praxis, so we're crossing our fingers that he passed. Um, we've graduated three teachers from our long-term sub list, and we now have three new certified, fully certified math teachers over the years. So this program has been very effective, and the longer we keep a long-term sub in the classrooms, the more we can work with them and help our students. So the next thing I wanna talk about is the professional development that we've been offering. And it's critical, right? We need the professional development for our for increase our math achievements. Um, guided math is a development, professional development. We've worked with our elementary teachers. Guided math is where um, teachers work with small groups of children at one time on specific skills or needs. And while they're working with those specific kids, the other kids are out in groups, doing stations, doing practice. Um, it takes a lot of management. It takes a lot of um, planning. So due to our lack of substitutes, we, I'm proud to say that since October, 
in the evening once a month, we have, along with Dottie Pinnell and myself, we have first grown those teachers in K to five, right? We have worked with them directly. They're our grade level leaders. They in turn are training teachers from the schools. So I'm proud to say we have 45 teachers, either teachers or academic coaches or interventionists that are representing our schools and meet with us once a month from 436. Um, of course, they get paid a stipend for their time. They in turn take everything we talk about, return to their buildings and share it with their colleagues. Um, and it's been very effective. So, and we thank them for their time after school. I actually had this tonight. So we recently have been awarded a $5,000 grant from the state for Math for Life. And due to our um, subgroup data with our CI, CSI and ATS schools, we decided to focus on the special education teachers. So we began last month um, with our new funding. And again, this is after school. In fact, I left there tonight to come here and we are working directly with nine teachers. Um, and so most of these teachers are from Orchard View and South and Eagle that are participating with us. And we're working on strategies, data, how to reach our um, special needs students. And then I want, this is, um, the state has a cohort called the Mountaineer Mathematics Master Teachers. And this is a group led by WVU, um, Matt Campbell and Joanne Burke Kinderman from Pocahontas Schools. And they've been awarded a grant from the um, Science, National Science Foundation. And so they're working at the state level to invite secondary teachers to apply, build their leadership skills, train these teachers, and then bring them back into their counties to work. This has been around for two years, and we are proud to say that we have two teachers that have been selected to work with the state level. So um, Joshua Jones teaches at Martinsburg North Middle, and Elaine Schwain works at Musselman High School. And so they have been able to, so Joshua is working with Sean Little on his building, and the whole point of this group is they find a topic that bugs them, right? They work together to figure out how to fix it. They collect data and they report back. So this is the first year we've been fortunate to have these in our county. So Josh and Sean have been working on um, working on students' perseverance, their mindset towards math, and working with word problems. Elaine has been working with two of her teachers from Musselman High School, and they are working on the same thing, kids' attitudes towards math, mindset, and knowing that if you make a mistake, it's okay, right, that we learn from our mistakes. So these two have been working with this year with the support of federal programs. We're able to give these teachers a small stipend. And Elaine and Josh will be presenting their findings at the WVCTM uh, conference on March 17th and 18th. So in conclusion, moving forward, um, I'm proud of the work that we have done, but we have so much more work to do. Um, we are going to keep building the relationship between academic coaches, TISs, and interventions. They're directly in the schools. They're kind of like my direct line to work with the people in their buildings. Um, continue the guided math cohort with our teachers. And then, of course, I, the secondary math cohort will continue to work with us year after year. We have a small number of teachers in M3T, the math and your mathematics project, but we hope to um, get more teachers involved next year because the teachers teaching teachers is very effective. And then finally, keep promoting that positive mindset that of Math and Berkeley County Schools and our kids can be successful. So that's my quick report of math for the year. <laughs> uh, questions from members of the board? I just had a question and I think I asked this before. Um, why do you think um, our test scores are so low in, in the 11th and 12th grade? The 11th and 12th I and I taught high, high school pretty much all my career. The older kids are tougher to reach the older kids, um, I don't, they don't see the value as much in education. So we're working really hard with the mindset, with the ed, like the SAT is important. Mm -hmm. um, I think that has helped to get them to see the value of education and the fact that this will help them move further along. But the older they get, they're tougher to crack. Um, yeah. And I also think kids don't have like that mindset, like they can do it. Like math is important. I really need to work hard at this. So that's where we're trying to promote the positive mindset with the kiddos. But yeah. How important math is. Yes, and why it's important yeah. and why they need it. Mr. Wright? 
No, I was just I was just thinking about what you said about the older students and then yeah. what came to mind for me is thinking that maybe they're thinking I I have I know all the math I need to know. Right. Why do so I need to do this? Why do I need to know I need physics to and calculus? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, they're, good enough. yeah, they're a tough, they're a tough group. Questions? I have I, I I've asked this question before, um, not not of of you, of course. Um and I'm going to keep coming back to it because something stuck with me when we were at our, our school board training recently. Uh -huh. um, and it was the focus of leading indicators versus lagging. Right. And I are with this program, are you using leading or are you using lagging? Tonight, I, I focused on our summative, our lagging. Um, I didn't talk too much about what we do currently, um, mm -hmm. but we do like in the guided math cohort, we really talk to the teachers about, okay, let's, let's form until we assess these kids. What skill are you working on this week? Mm -hmm. um, not so much with, I mean, we have the star assessments. So that's part of our guided math cohort. How do you, how are you assessing these kids and know where they're going to go? Secondary, we do a lot of work with the IXL, which right now um, we need to get back into it. Um, but a lot of the focus of our professional development is, what are you using now with your classroom to drive your instruction? Um, which is the work we continue to do with them. Okay. Even like a quick once a week, let's see where those kiddos are. <clears throat> yeah, because that was one of the things that they they really were, you know, they, they were talking to us about that being something that we're, we're gonna really be able to see a lot of yes. progress. Yes. Um, you know, our focus typically is on the lagging data. It is, yes. And we need to be more focused on mm -hmm. the leading data. Yes. And so the, I would love to see more of that information okay. come out just because it helps us understand mm -hmm. what we're, what we Where are we're doing from day to day. Um, this was great information. I love that you were able to show that we are progressing and yes. that, that children are, are getting it. But um, I'd love to see what's... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Guided math, that's one of our big pushes, like... So why why is this child in this group? And why, when they get this group, what are you going to do to guide your instruction? Yes. Yeah. We have a lot of information. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to ask when it comes to my mind. <laughs> I understand. Do we have a lot of information on the leading data? Um, we have Rob Robin Lopez had some last time. Yes, she had some, but yeah. I mean, how well is it how immediate is it? I mean, how it probably depends on, I'll be honest with you, it depends on what classroom you're in. Like we do the star assessments and IXLs do the benchmark. The IXL, the kids should work on it every week and we can immediately see every week where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, of course, now it's hard to get the data. Yeah. In elementary, we have the star assessment and we get that every um, every every nine weeks. Um, what I've been trying to push with teachers is, what do you know as a in your room now? What simple paper pencil yeah. thing can you give to tell me where where is Jackie? Like, how did she get that concept? Um, so that's a mix based on where um, which classroom you're in. But I totally agree that we need to work more on that and get more yeah. of that information to know where our kids are at now. Because that that I think that's important. Um, okay. Yeah. And then I had another question after you asked your question. Well, I gotta get Mr. Martin. Oh. <laughs> oh. Um, this this year after year, it's always we're below what like the what their new average in West Virginia is. Yeah. And what's graph below 50th, 43rd, right? And any in between. Is there anything like you see that's a pinpoint problem that we're having to not even meet the, the West Virginia average? Is it is it the certified teachers? Mm -hmm. I think mainly? It's, it's a, some some of it is the fact that it, it is um the, the lack of teachers that are coming out, the uncertified, the long-term subs. Um, I don't, I don't think, I do know we work really hard right now with our teachers to change the way we teach math, right? To give them that, because math is even scary to some teachers, right? They didn't like it in school, so they're just like, oh, that's how I used to do it. So we're, we're I think a big, one of the problems is the, the teacher's knowledge, the teacher's capacity. So that's why we do those professional developments to say, Here's why a fraction is a fraction, and here's why um, those controversial, you know, topics. Like working with teachers, kids need to be able to think and problem solve, right? Mm -hmm. And we really need to work on with our kids of giving them independence and letting them struggle. It's really hard for teachers. I was the worst. I was an enabler to watch kids struggle because you just want to go help. Like I always had a pencil right here. Let me go and help them. So part of the problem is we don't have the long-term subs. They don't have that confidence in math themselves 
to work with the kids, um, which is part of the problem. And the fact of mindset, most kids, our biggest thing in math is kids need to believe that they can do it, mm -hmm. right? I Most kids go, oh, my mom says I can't do this, right? So that's a huge piece. So I always promote, like, I don't want to hear anyone in Berkeley County Schools ever say they don't do math and they can't do math. Just don't I get upset. I do, I get all fired up because all kids in Berkeley County can do math. So we have to fix that mindset, right? Let them think that they can do it. 11th grade, I know the SAT is hard, but you can do it. So the work Elaine's doing at Musselman and Josh with those kids at North is trying to convince them that they can do it, which is the hard battle. So of yeah. course, making math fun. Yes. Yeah, I think it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it can be fun for all because yeah. nobody wants to sit there and just do drill and drill and drill. We want to have games. We want to have problem solving. We want to have robotics. We want to have hands-on things for the kiddos to do, like guided math. If you're in math for an hour, give the kids something to do every 10 or 15 minutes to make them want to be there. Um, yeah. Do you, do you think, so sorry, it's following. just um, would it be better to go back to the basics instead of interjecting pilot programs and other, the new this, this, this versus like what's been like studied and right. research based? You, well, the, uh, the most new research base is the basics are fine. It's just the way we teach mathematics, right? We need to teach with these, we call them the habits of mind, right? We want to teach our kids to persevere. We want our kids to learn to talk to each other. We want our kids to sit in math class and not be quiet. We want our kids to draw pictures. We want our kids to use tools. Um, little guys should be using manipulatives. Um, so back to basics is good. It's just it's the whole approach the way we teach math. Mm -hmm. um, is is get math, you know, get the kids. Math is a bunch of patterns, right? Let yeah. the kids discover the patterns. Let them figure out why. If we do that, if we do those habits of mind, then our, our scores will come up. Yeah, I, I just see that yeah. people are like, why don't you just teach them what they used to? Like, to no, really no. But I know they get mad, and I know my Facebook page blows up, and I have to watch what I say because I need my job. But it's it's <laughs> approach of how we teach math is what we need to do. Like, mm -hmm. how do we approach math for kiddos? Drilling and killing after 45 minutes is not going to build their excitement. So we want to have kids involved with the math. Yeah. I always said, if it's rooms full quiet, it's not good. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you. <laughs> go to Cindy Everett's class itself. And it'll be great. There's a lot of talking and discussing and problem solving there. Well, I think that's a good point you made too about the way that math taught. Yes. It's like my grandson comes over and he, he does math and we do math. And you know, I think math's fun and Thank he thinks math's fun. Yeah. But the way that he does the problems, what he thinks is it's different than the way that I learned. Yeah. And I like his way better. So yes. Because it makes more sense. It so does. I'm like, okay, now I see, yeah. and, you know. Generationally, I think if you're so focused on going back to the basics, but the way we learn sometimes is not the best way to make us really right. figure things out yes. and go further. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, that's we want them to think. We want kids to think. So, here's my question. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, for like the next hour, but I'll be good. Yeah. Um, no, you talked about the, the guided cohorts, and we uh -huh. earlier uh, we you know, read letters from teachers, from Miss Abel in particular, about the time. Mm -hmm. I right. think that I know these these are after school, but do you, have you heard concerns from even some of those in the cohorts and, and the, some of the math teachers about not having enough time to adequately plan the lessons to really teach the way they go? We've teach. heard those concerns, and we do. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we've met since October. Mm -hmm. So when we get in our grade level teens, um, they do some planning, right? So with our grade level leaders. Like Kelsey Murphy is my first grade leader for um, first grade at Hedgesville Elementary. Kelsey will spend that hour and a half and they do, they plan ideas, they plan things, they plan resources. So then when they go back to their colleagues, they're like, hey, we just spent some time together and put all our minds together. Here's some ideas for the next three or four weeks in school. So we make sure that when we do our cohort times that we build planning time in. Because guided math does take some planning. It really does. So we're trying to give them time to go back to their schools. And on Schoology, we do have a really big folder of games and activities that any teacher can pull at any time and use in their classroom. Which again, it goes back to my academic coaches who are invaluable and they help plan. And they can go into a classroom now and be like, oh, you're working on fractions. Let's try X, Y, and Z. So we're trying to build around them to make their life easier for planning. Because it is, yeah. But that's a big piece of the guided math cohort is they sit and they talk and they collaborate and they plan. And then they bring it back. Um, and this might go, I guess, maybe more towards Tana because I don't, I don't know which 
avenue where you know which avenue right, to, yeah. to we well i don't know but I'm just like, <laughs> you might have more of the answer than, okay. than than what she might um i know with our lsics we've been hearing a lot about the ixl math mm -hmm. and how kids are it looks so good on paper that they're that they're excelling but they're actually going and, and doing math problems that they might have been able to do previously um and have a mastery level um and, and they like doing that and that's i don't necessarily see that as a problem so much as you know those kids that need that little bit of push to get right. that rigor back right um have we voiced a concern or a request yet to IXL as far as you know putting some sort of buffer in the program so that the teachers have control that they can't go below a certain level there, to, um, to kind of keep that, that rigor pushing they can and kids you know kids are kids they are figured it out kids are kids happens. so there are there are a couple things teachers can do um one they can go in and override things but I, I can't talk to IXL as long as it's automatic there's a button on IXL called live classroom so if the kids are in front of them and they click live classroom, they can see exactly what the kids are doing. Oh, so I can be working with this group of kids over here and I'll put throw Tana on the bus. Little Tana's over there <laughs> on kindergarten and I'm in my eighth grade room. I'm telling you, I taught kids little, and you can even send a kid a message yeah. like, um, you're on the wrong thing. Or just a simple book. Um, that's where the tisses come in. So we've been trying to educate the tisses on those little things Okay. on IXL so they can share with their teachers. But that is something in IXL we've talked, and IXL is aware of it, yeah. that the kids, okay. it's really easy for them to go down, but that live classroom button, I think it's pretty powerful because yeah. if I'd be a little tan and someone just gave me one look or talk, my parents were strict. Trust me, I'd be off in a second. Yeah, you know, that's the first time I've heard somebody the live, the live classroom. classroom. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I actually okay. have the live classroom button where I can see any kid in the district at any time. Um, but classroom teachers, that's part of the professional development and the, and the teaching with the tisses, like guys, just hit the live classroom button. Do, do uh, many classroom teachers use it? I'm we're we're getting the word out. We're getting the word out that the monitoring piece yeah. needs to be improved. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it yeah. Does. I yes. when I'm in a room, I'm like, y'all forgot about the live classroom button, right? And well, that's where still the tisses come in. And and not to not to. But they're still kids. They, they're, and they, they still yeah, they are, but we've got <laughs> we've got a lot on our on our teachers too. Yeah. So yeah. If it's you just have those little gentle reminders that hey, there's that little button. And that's so, where the tiss is coming. That's yeah. why that relationship okay. building. I'm like, great, this is let me show you this button. <laughs> um yeah. And it's a simple little thing you can do to keep an eye on. Okay. My concern. Any more questions? <laughs> um, my concern. One of them is that uh, the COVID money is going to run out, and I'm wondering yes. how many TIS, I know, academic coaches, I'm concerned. and uh, interventions are on that list mm -hmm. and being funded there. Yeah, and because uh, I don't, I don't foresee uh, that kind of money coming back into the county after March of 24. Yeah, I'm concerned myself because there's huge help there. That's one woman trying to watch yeah. K-12, and uh, the, I don't have to check. Um, and also, uh, it, it looks like you're using the National Certified Teachers Board approach mm -hmm. for math teachers mm -hmm. uh, there, but you don't have the cash incentive. I, have... <laughs> <laughs> I know, but if I can get the long-term subs to be certified, then I bring up the three-step increase. The one teacher I referred to who just took his test, I'm like, do you not want a three-step increase? And then we told his uh, wife. And then yeah. she made sure he didn't. It's always a so. It's always a way. We 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 knew how to fix that right away, and I'm pretty sure he passed. So, okay. <laughs> but I know the the tisses and the coaches and the interventionists that they are invaluable, and I wanted to promote their work. Yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm just concerned about. I, mean, I am too. If they have to go back to the classrooms, yeah, uh, they'll be valuable people, but they're they're. The ripple effect will not be reaching as far as the right. 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 Okay. Are, do we have any more questions? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, we had two speakers earlier tonight. I uh, see them sitting there um, planning. Um, at some point, I'm going to let, let you all ask any questions because we normally, under Citizen Storm, cannot talk to uh, the participants because it's not on the agenda. but Tonight, Mr. Burton is going to come forward, and we're going to talk some about the uh, planning commission inquiry and discussion. So, 
Uh, Burton, I hope you're ready for this. Uh, I want to point out that uh, I went down to talk to Ms. Hoffmaster last week, and the first thing she told me was, well, Mr. Burton was in here the week before, wondering, you know, if we didn't have real SC Joe's But uh, first, uh, before he began, so I just want to talk that there are three steps in the planning commission process. You have a sketch plan, and that is where we, the board, are involved, not involved, but they're using our data from somewhere to do to do things. And she and Miss Hoffmaster told me that between the sketch plan, then you have the preliminary plan, then the final plan. It's about a year's difference. So we do get some numbers, but I'm gonna let I'm not gonna take Mr. Burton's thunder away because he wants to talk about that formula and some other things. Go ahead. Yeah, there's really not much thunder, but I am here to answer whatever questions I can help with. But uh in, in general, I guess what, what I'll talk about is the, the school impact form that is completed by builders or developers at the time that they're turning in their sketch plan for approval. So there's some some calculations there's some calculations on, on that form that project how many new students would come out of whatever new development it is that they're they're talking about. Uh, those numbers are different based on whether it's a single family home, a townhouse, a rental apartment, or, or a condominium that would be added. So as we've been checking in with the planning commission over the last couple of weeks, trying to see how, how can the board of ed possibly have a greater voice in this process, and how is that process working right now? Uh, I think what we've learned is, is that form is still being completed, but it's just going along with the rest of the paperwork. It's not really being reviewed by anybody at the Board of Education. We really have not had much voice in that process. Uh, however, the calculations that are used on that form were at, at some point approved by the Board of Education in the past. So I reached out to uh, Mr. Preston Smith, who did our our long-term demographic study and, and uh, helped us make an analysis on, on where to build new schools and what our, what our needs for new schools would look like going forward. And I asked him what he thought about the numbers and shared the form with him. He said, in, in general, you know, the, the form is okay. The numbers are just outdated. And for the most part, they just trend a little bit low for townhouses, apartments, and condos but the single family home number is particularly low. So where we may be a couple points off on townhouses, we're 40% or so low on the single family homes. So what that looks like, if you just took one example, or uh, you know, 200 new single family homes at the current calculation, which is 0.22 new students per home, that would be 44 new elementary school students only. And at the recommended calculation Mr. Mr. Smith is talking about, he said between three and four, point three and point four. If we do point three five, that's 70 students. So from 44 to 70, it's a whole other classroom of mm -hmm. students that would, would come out of those. And that's just at the elementary level. The same thing would be true at middle school and at high school in, in the same development. So I think going forward, it's just a, a, another challenge to the board to try to be a more active participant in this process and maybe challenge the, 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 not only challenge the numbers on the form, but how is the form being used? Because as it is right now, it is being completed, but if, if the final, if the final, <laughs> um, Alexis is going to figure it out for us. Um, <laughs> Yeah, derailed it every time. Serious fault. It's it's not it's not just the the numbers, but it's what are we doing with those numbers. Mm -hmm. So I think as it is right now, even when it shows that the result of this new development would be that the schools are going to be over one hundred percent, that's just what the fact is, and it still carries on. Uh, that I know of, there's, there's no subdivisions being denied because schools are going to be over one hundred percent, and. Uh, as one of our speakers mentioned earlier, all the hedges, we're talking about hedges built just because of one new development, but it's, it's everywhere you look. If you look through this uh, activity report that Mr. Murphy passed on to me, 
you know, every district and many new single family homes and many new townhouses and there's apartments coming also. But just in Hedgesville, our projections from our study that's already going on a couple of years old, uh, the elementary school is projected to be, this is all by 2030, at 109%. Uh, intermediate school at 142%, the middle school at 119, and the high school at 111%. And those percentages we've already determined are, are low. You know, we're trending well above those projections. So all I can do is report on, on uh, what's being done and, and on what we see happening, but it, I definitely think it's a, a challenge of the board and, and I think we're all certainly willing to, to help uh, be involved in this process and, and do whatever we can to be a part of it. You know, the, um, uh, I was trying to find a summary of the year for the uh, magisterial districts. I found it on the page, is it? But um, the other, you, you hit on two points there that we need to uh, discuss. I am planning on uh, the approval of the uh, board uh, and with senior staff working on a meeting with the uh, county council. Uh, we have a couple of issues. This would be one of them uh, as far as uh, legislation is concerned. Um, impact fees, which a lot of people bring up, uh, have, you have to reach certain requirements. Um, you have to have zoning, which has failed twice in the county. Uh, back in the 90s, you know, I guess in the 2000s. You have to have a building codes, which the county has. You have to have a comprehensive plan, which the county has. And you have to have a certain, uh, it's decimal, of, uh, every 10 years, you have to have a certain percentage growth, which we have. So we have three of the four requirements. And um, uh, we, we need to sit down and talk with the uh, county council about the fourth one. Uh, whether a zoning should be a standalone issue or a be a, or, and that, that would take a change in the law. Uh, there are other issues like uh, um, with the uh, water and sewer. Uh, we don't have any input there uh, with the uh, with the uh, two boards. Uh, I'm trying to think here. But, uh, the, the groups which have seem to have the greatest influence would be your health department. Uh, because uh, subdivisions have to meet certain, it, the density depends upon whether you have wells or water lines or, and whether you have septic or sewer lines. And uh, so, you, so the health department has a lot of say. What people would read in this thing is that the school board, it says here, these factors or multipliers have been approved by the Berkeley County School Board and are based on historical information. You know, the history is outdated. And two, we don't approve individual flats or, or um, it's another word, uh, sketch plans. And we don't, and at one point we didn't raise here, you talked to Mr. Smith, but we haven't figured out where they get the capacity for the schools. Did you want to say anything about that? Well, that, 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 like that there has been occasion where they have called and, and asked us for those, you know, various people have called a, a developer or a builder has, but there there are plenty of times where I'm not aware of where they got that information. So I'm not sure how accurate it is. Mm -hmm. I think you can look and, and Google it and, and get fairly fairly accurate information. I don't think that's what people are doing. Yeah, so, some of the, uh, somebody told me, I mean, maybe it was you to school. Um, and some, some studies say, well, if you have a planning period, if the teacher has a planning period, that means there are no students in the classroom at that time. Well, some some sources are saying, well, put the teacher on a cart and let him come in and use that empty classroom at that time, that increases capacity. Uh, but the, as teachers who have traveled from the room there, it's not, it's not it's an ideal way. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a the teacher is not prepared when the bell rings to come out of the gate teaching, uh, I would say. But uh, uh, we need to we need to follow up. I want to let our two guests yeah, ask a question. A question. Yes, ma'am. I do. Um, you talked about the, the four things that you want to talk to Berkeley County Council about, and you said 
one of them was the comprehensive plan. Um, maybe just jotting a note, it's my understanding that that comprehensive plan is supposed to be updated. Um, it's either that or the subdivision ordinance um, is supposed to be updated every 10 years and it's wildly out of date right now. They're working off of a, uh, off of, um, I guess a, uh, uh, what do they call it? Um, an interim plan of some sort. So- You mean um, county council or us? County council. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and the planning commission, specifically yeah. the planning yeah. commission off the master plan. It hasn't been um, properly updated even in its normal cycle. And as we all know, nothing's normal about what happened in 2020 and beyond, especially for our area and the migration that, that we've experienced. And I've been here long enough to see that first wave that came through, you know, 10, 15, 15 years ago. And, and now, I mean, it, it is, is, we all see it, we feel it every day, but if you try to pull data, right? Um, which, you know, I'm a data-driven person, I get it. Um, that data is not accurate and it's going off of inaccurate numbers that have not been reflected. And I understand studies cost money and you just got done one with the comprehensive plan of 2019 that projected out to 2030. And it immediately, as far as I'm concerned, became outdated within a year, right? Um, so, I mean, I'm, I, and then to your point about the school impact um, forms, where is that data published? Because, um, you know, people can just randomly start picking, you know, if, what if they don't call you and ask you what the school capacities are in this particular one? And this is the first one I'm seeing, but I'm interested now. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm in it. it. This this started it for me, but it's now I'm full in. I went to the planning commission meeting before I came to you guys, and I watched them approve within five minutes and a stroke of a pen, they had another almost like 50 homes that are approved now to move to the next um, with no talk at all in that a public hearing or any of the, the preliminary stuff about the school impact forms. Well, they, they, uh, what Mr. Berg said is one way we could approach it, he and I have not had a discussion, but go down and get a couple of sketch plans from five years ago, see what the projections were, and then go to the transportation department and see what the actual number of students were put there. If you look at the um, but there there's actually online the uh, the Berkeley County Planning Commission had um a, a study that they released that had those projections, and then they just literally published the 2022 growth chart. You know, for how many houses were added, how much business was added. That's all out there in, on the the read aheads from tonight's meeting. So if you want to find those on, yeah, you've got there. They've got, yeah, they've got all the numbers in there. It's crazy how much we've had in terms of um, in terms of, of the addition of homes just in one year, let alone in the last three years. Well, I guess my uh, concern I have, a question I have, and this is probably for them, but um, it's my understanding, and I heard someone say this, one of the commissioners, that uh, they cannot deny a development but That's correct. Yeah. And so for me, as somebody who's here, right, and I'm not emotionally attached to this from a child perspective, because like I told you, my kids are, are done, right? But I'm I'm a resident here that cares. And and I just feel like you guys have the power to go to the county council and demand that 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 they stop they stop draining you so badly, right? And when I say you, I mean all of these people that were here. I wish the Hedgesville Middle people had stayed here to hear this. These are hardworking people who, and you were just talking about that, sir, you know, they are drained, they are tired. And, and it's just, we can't, the, the county council will come at you and say, well, that's why we're trying to bring all these houses, affordable housing, affordable housing. That's not, that's not no, translating, no. it's not working. It's not working because we don't have the teachers to support this this influx of people that you know will come for, with this affordable housing. And I just feel like we've got to slow down and let specifically the water infrastructure, the road infrastructure in, in terms of, and I know Mr. Gokenauer has been down, and I believe Mr. Catlett's been down to Charleston working hard to try to get the division of highways to pay attention to us as well. But I feel like right now, of the big three, water, roads, and schools, you guys are the ones that are the most impacted, which is why I'm sitting here tonight. Well, so. we're, we're, we're initiating, I'm a week behind Mr. Burton there, going to the Planning Commission, but we're initiating a conversation with the commission 
Um, we we have bond sales coming up right in, uh, in May, and we're waiting till after the bond sales to sit down with the commission because we don't want to have an impact on the bond sales right now. Yeah. Uh, it, as far as the community, so we want to get that out of the way, and then we're going to sit down with the commission and put our heads together. Who, who knows else we need to expand that conversation? Usually, it's more productive to keep it smaller than to get into a large, into a large round table. I agree. Uh, have people <laughs> going at it uh, in different directions. But we are, uh, because of the uh, subdivision of again at Long Harlan. I've had a, a, a neighbor of yours, a friend of mine, ask, and I so I went down just to find out what you know what is the process. Uh, but we probably need to first look at the sketch plans of a couple of years ago, see the actual mm -hmm. impact versus the uh, projected, and then uh, up and then go to them and ask because it's out of our control the numbers they have here. Mm -hmm. We approved them apparently somewhere in the past, but we need to re revisit those numbers. Mm -hmm. The other thing is uh, that we need to look at things in the in the plan that could help offset the impact upon our people. Someone, I think it was you, uh, indicated our population is growing, but a lot of people who are not uh, raising children, it's not growing as fast as the older population. And at a point, you're going to get people who just say, I, I've, I've raised my children, let them raise theirs, and they're not going to support schools. Yes. And so we have to be cognizant of that uh, uh, growth factor. But uh, I wanted you all to stay to hear his presentation. I'm glad we, we did. We are starting, to, we are beginning our conversation, late as it may be, we're, we are approaching this. Uh, late is better than never. <laughs> so, yeah. and that's why we're here because it's, you know. Well, I'm it, glad you stayed because I wanted you all to yeah. hear. <laughs> I appreciate any efforts you guys take. I, I can't, you know. I can't do it all myself, and 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 Miss Mitchell and I are just a small team right now. We're growing though. We're, we're the, the voices are growing, and we're really trying to energize this county to say enough. We're you know in, in the in the words of my Italian grandmother, basta, right? <laughs> so I just I yeah. need to I, I I'm glad that you guys listened. So thank you for that. We have to you have to be aware aware the way government is organized on the county level. You do not have an. Uh, a, like in Maryland, I think Maryland has more centralized control over everything. Like the county commission is also over top of schools, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. No. And and uh, no. It's not no, they're they they are over the so the county commission, at least in Washington County, um has some purse strings. Yeah. But that's, that's but that is very limited. Their scope is very, very limited. They do have zoning, which then gives them a little bit more ability to to have a steadier growth instead of a huge influx um but they also seek out i do know the with the planning commission there they do seek out input from the school board and from water and sewer and they they do that in their planning so that they can make a better decision um, i don't know what our commission does in that regard it doesn't from what I'm hearing this evening, it doesn't sound like it's all encompassing as far as gathering all the information before a vote is done. But the, I actually had a question if you're okay if I ask okay. it now. Um, do we know when exactly this pupil yield factor was done? When those calculations were created, I'm not sure. Oh God. Yes, um, okay. You mean then, um, this page? Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. And then the other question, and this maybe is something that, that we have that discussion, whoever goes with the planning commission or the um, county commissioners, it says that the planning commission is presently composed of six, eight citizen members, including one member of the county council. My assertion would be, should that be something where, you know, maybe there's someone from our board that also works with this group so that there is an awareness from our representative grouping on what this looks like as far as impact on schools. All right. The, uh, we did, we do have a person who was a former employee who's uh, Eric Goff. 
And I think he he wanted to serve on the, on the commission, but he's no longer an employer. Uh, and it's unlike the Parks and Rec and the other boards we appoint, this this was not one. You have to realize that the county commission appoints the planning commission, but then the planning commission is a free and independent body of the county commission. Right. Uh, so the, the decisions they make are within their, their own grasp and not reviewable by the county commission. Now, the, okay. county, the county commission can replace members to try to change the direction of the planning commission, but as far as day-to-day -day control of the things like this, that, that's not the case. Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking about that. that it, they serve a three-year term. There's six citizen members. You know, if we can advocate to the commission who appoints the, the planning commission members, can, can one of those be someone from the board? One of those be that seat? Yeah. For, for a board of education. Usually it's statutorily created mandates that, that the board of education has an appointment on there. Uh, we could ask them to change their bylaws to increase it, but right now the law of right, the state right. does not have that. Jackie? I, I was just always hoping, and I think we would talk about this before, that we could have a liaison between the board of education and the county council. Um, we, yeah, uh, we need to put that in the agenda when we meet with them in the yeah. second part of that. Because, uh, um, like uh, many groups, that, well, even at the Stubblefield Institute, when we went to that, every there was a water, sewer, mm -hmm. and, uh, health department, on and on and on. But nobody from the board was asked to sit on that panel. Mm -hmm. None. And we presented questions, and we, you know, you had to submit your questions, and hopefully they would answer one of them. But we didn't even get our questions answered. So, Ms. Mitchell, like disappointing. Ms. Mitchell. Um. Yes. Okay. So, sorry if I'm just missing something, but why can a development not be denied? I understand that there is no zoning, but if it's going to have a devastating effect on the area, why is it's not grounds for denial. I, that's lost on that's me. Not up to us. That's not No, no, I and I understand that. What, what, what it appears to me to be is a checkoff system. As long as they, the, the Department of Highways has a lot of say because of egress in and out of the uh, subdivision. Right. But as long as they fill out the paper, and, they, I, and I don't know if, it, if they exceed the numbers here or what. Uh, they can't be denied because of this piece of paper. It's just a checkoff. And so they, even though it shows that they're already over capacity, yeah, and yeah, that they would be yeah. adding even, you know, either, if they, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so, I mean, really, what's, I mean, not to sound um, it's flippant, but what's the point of even filling that form? Well, I think that form was not to uh, approve or deny a subdivision. It was to give the board a heads up. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. You're going to do that. Yeah. That's and so not that, fair to you guys. That, that checklist is really, you know, it's, it's the, the sewer department signing off on it, PUA signing off on it, stormwater sign off. So there, there are requirements to make. And if, if they've gone through their due diligence and they meet those requirements, then. Well, then other than somehow retroactively changing the fact that we don't have zoning laws, how can we change the, the narrative? Is this a possible thing, or are we just like grasping at straws right. here? I, I'm not qualified to answer that. <laughs> I, think, I think change is possible. What we have to realize is it's, it's long term, this isn't a short play. Mm -hmm. Uh, everything you see in front of you is going to happen, you're not going to stop it. Uh, but we, we can change the narrative by looking forward 10 years and 20 years, and looking at <laughs> some other states do with impact fees with requiring uh, land to be set aside in these big subdivisions for future full locations. I mean, it, there, there's working models in like numerous other states. I know. But we have to look, like I said, it's not gonna happen tomorrow. It's, it's something we have to move towards more, you know, more distant future. Okay. You had a question, go ahead. Well, more of a statement. You know, I can talk to the city and their planning how, and how they run. Jason Baker, I'm part of the city council. Um, everything on this checklist, and I'm almost, I'll speak of just the city, not the county's level. As a, as a builder, you can fix those issues. If it's egress issues, 
I can pay for a, another entrance. I can pay, if I go over the 99, I can have another entrance come into it. I can expand the road to have that subdivision. If it's water, I can write, I can raise the size of the pipe that's coming to me so that I can do it. If it's sewer, it's all those things. So all of those have a checklist. And the reason they have a checklist is I can fix that. As a developer, you can't fix that. You can't fix a school. You can't say, hey, we're going to put this in without an impact fee. And obviously, this county has chosen to not accept impact fees. I personally don't see that ever changing. I don't think this county will ever accept an impact fee. Um, if anything, I can tell you that the city is, is to look more into allowing growth to come back into our city so that we are probably, if anything, going to try to entice more building inside of our city because we have the opposite of what's going on in Edgeville. You know, we're, we, we're growing, but we're growing on subdivisions that are outside of our school system, you know, and as city councilman, when's the last time the city, there was a new elementary school built in the city? When was the last time there was a new school built inside of the city? Yeah. You know, we talk about all these other areas but nothing's happening inside the city of Martinsburg. So why would a council, city councilman, ever endorse any type of impact fee? Because we have zoning. Yeah. The city of Martinsburg has zoning. Why would we as a city council ever endorse impact fees for the school system that is not building new schools and has overcrowded our schools in our, in our city and haven't been part of that is that you all won't be part of our conversation of the issues that the city council has in our schools that we have. You know, one of the biggest answers that you did with the overpopulations of, of uh, Martinsburg High School was when you all redistricted. You just pulled students. You just pulled you just pulled them into the Spring Mills district, and we just pulled classrooms, trailer classrooms at that. I understand, but we're still not renovating. You know, Martinsburg High School setting here. It's the, it is the only school that, it's the last school to be, it's the oldest one that hasn't been renovated or had updates, major additions well, to the school. We do have a $6 million renovation coming to Marksburg High School, mm -hmm. over a million dollars in renovation coming to Burke Street Elementary. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of projects in that. And there's a number of small you know, classrooms in Marksburg High School, not one. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a potential for some learning space. In no, the and, and in, the, in the addition into Burke Street is no new classroom. You're right. So yeah, you're talking. It, it's easy, and that was your sales pitch at the bond meeting when when we approved this. That that's that was your, under, uh, that's with all due respect. That was your sales. That was your all sales pitch. It's no new. That all that you were putting this money at Martinsburg High School. You were putting this money at Burke Street, but not a new classroom. Right. Well, we're uh, not yeah. not to debate. And I and I, and I apologize. <laughs> my, my, my point was more on the planning side of it. Is you know you're talking about Berkeley County, but the city has planned. Well, we, we have the ability to do yeah. an impact in the house. I'm Jason Baker. Okay. 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 I said that might have said it loud enough. I, I apologize, Ms. Murphy. Well, why do right. we district students back into those schools when we don't have room to put them there and then build onto those schools just to so the city of Martinsburg can have growth? Well, but uh, let me I, I, let me correct. What saying? But let me correct a misunderstanding. But you are going to place the trailers. Let, yeah, let, me, fine. let me jump in here, Mr. Baker. Uh, we no, are we're going not. to build. We're no, going to no, this no. this long, please. I, I'm, I'm trying to. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to start off. No, <laughs> no. I, I want you to understand that there, there's a misconception here of one. We are going to build two. Pre-K centers. Those pre-K centers are going to take pre-K classrooms out of the existing schools around the county and, and everything. Mm -hmm. Those are going to create new state classrooms for uh, kindergarten through fifth grade uh, and the elementary school, even up to the high school. Mm -hmm. We have children who are four years old walking through the hallways of Hedgesville High School or did have it. And that's going to free up a classroom at Hedgesville High. I think we have some pre-K classrooms within the city. And, uh, and uh, maybe, uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head. But those classrooms, which are being used for free kindergartners, are now going to be free for the children K through 12 if they're over at the high school. So 
there is a misconception there that a lot of people in the community don't realize. We're getting more than just the schools are doing. We're going to have classrooms freed up that, that, to put more students in in a lot of existing schools. I think there are 40 some classrooms. Yes. 40 some pre K classrooms countywide. Now, I'm not saying just Martinsburg, countywide. They're going to be freed up for the standard, what I call the K through 12 schools. So I, I can't tell you how many are within Martinsburg. Second thing is, is that we ha have built schools in areas you all have expanded to. For example, Orchard View is part of the city of Martinsburg, which we appreciate for fire and everything else, protection and work. So we have built new schools, not recently, but we have to, we can't build everything everywhere at the time. We have to selectively put our bonds up there. One, we have to look at where the population has the greatest growth to build the schools there. So that's another factor. And when you look at the data for Spring Mills, it's just like a bomb going through there. And it's something we acknowledge, you know, as we we're doing our bond presentations, is at the time that study, our growth and population study was done, Martinsburg was the only static district of, of all our high school districts. And a short time later, you know, uh, nine months later, that had changed just with, with learning about all the new departments coming at in the uh, in Logan Mills uh, was not on our radar when, when that population study was done. And then by the time we're running a bond, it is. And that's how quickly all of this has changed. So we, we, we couldn't build one. We, we couldn't do, uh, <laughs> we, we couldn't keep slides current from one presentation to the next, not just in Martinsburg, but in all the districts. That's how quickly the numbers are changing. So, so you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it is difficult for us to keep up with. And we do have some old buildings in the city limits that are uh, in the plans to remodel. And, uh, of course, in the future, they're going to have to be expanded or replaced. And then we can go off into pilot programs where there's tax incentives to build these things, and yet education will not be able to collect the tax on the excess levy for those properties because they're done. So there we have education subsidizing economic development, which is another issue. So we, right. we have... We could we could have a renaissance fair. <laughs> and John, I, mean, I didn't mean in any disrespect to the goal of the board. It's just it, it, there. I understand interwoven. We also have Delmore. You did speak Delmore. That's going to be two hundred. You know, and I and I can tell you as a council, city council, we it's something that is talked about. as some of that, and it's the same thing as the county is with the you know the planning is is a separate entity. We give them the guidance of, you know, you have to have this, this, and this. And it is a checklist. And, you know, I I have no issue with the school being, school system being part of that. Um, but I can tell you that the city council, at least, is getting some of us, and I'm always speaking for myself, um, you know, we are getting frustrated because our schools are getting extremely old and are getting in bad, deplorable shape. And, you know, that's nothing that we want, you know, that, uh, that at least the city, and I'm sure that even you all don't want that. We, we, we can't close down old buildings around here. We need every classroom we can uh, keep. One last comment. I just have to say in the same vein, um, but it's more of, you guys care so much about kids' education and, I have been in many school districts. Unfortunately, I have been in ones that all care about kids' education, but we moved here in February of 2015. Um, I have one kid who's on the autism spectrum. My older kid was slightly speech delayed, but you guys had five new kids move to the district and you opened up a classroom in Burke Street Elementary and it was like a huge closet off of the cafeteria so that these kids, because I know that you have to for early intervention and for people that have IEPs, but you guys made it happen for kids that also otherwise didn't necessarily have to have pre-K in the middle of the year. And I mean, that was eight years ago now. And that just has stuck with me on how much you guys really do care 
about the, the welfare and well-being of the children in this community. And so while we're ragging on different things, you guys care so intensely. And I mean, I have to say that I do appreciate that. It's not just about the money. It's not just about the buildings. You guys want the kids to excel. And um, that's, like I said, something that has stuck with me since the moment we moved here on February 6th of 2015. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Amen to that. Any Can more I, comments from the board? I just want to say thank you for all of you guys coming in and, and speaking. I, I know we had a little bit of a vigorous debate there for just a second, but I, I think it's healthy and I, I love the fact that we all had conversation. We had questions we were able to answer as best we could. In some cases, we can't answer for those who are not represented here tonight, but I just wanted to say thank you and you know, from someone who literally commented just a little bit before the meeting I, that I hadn't seen a healthy, calm, rational conversation debate around something that can get so heated. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank that, you for listening. That you guys it. came. And I, I just, thank you. Well, I apologize for getting heated. Oh, okay. James, thank you. It's okay. We've got plenty of conversations on Facebook, so we're... <laughs> <laughs> I had great offense to anything said by about our schools, and uh, these kids mean a lot to me. These schools mean a lot to me. I went to Martinsburg High School. I graduated from there, and you know, I, I, we try to keep our schools up the best that we can with the resources that we can, and take care of the, the students at the same time. So it's not that we uh, don't care about the city. We do. We care about everything. It's just hard to do it all. Well, That's thank you for the opportunity to to get a chat back, and uh, thank you, Joe, for you know the information. I appreciate it. I just want y'all to know you're just one of the cogs that we're you know we're we're, we're, we're hitting them all because uh, it it all has to everything has to come together. It's not just the schools. You know, like I said, water, infrastructure, emergency services, roads. You know, they're all impacted. Every every everybody's getting impacted by this. So yeah. I just feel like it's time for somebody to say something. So it's gonna end up being me in case. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Much to my husband's dismay. I need to take him out of here. <laughs> He's going <brilliant. laughs> my marriage may not survive this meeting. No. <laughs> He's been okay, a good I can move on to the next <laughs> thank you guys. Thank I appreciate you. you. Thanks for hanging around. There. Thanks. Uh the bond project update there. Um, Jessica uh, I would say that probably the big news at the last meeting was the Attorney General signed up with the paper and we were able to publish the uh, first of two uh, uh, advertisements. Yeah. Right? I'm going to um, label out the paper. Okay, I, I think that's about it. Did you have anything? Yep, that's all I have. Okay, moving on to action items. Uh, Ms. Burkhardt, thank you for your patience with us. Good evening, members of the board. Um, this evening is the final phase of our calendar for the 2023-2024 school year. We have uh, had two public hearings with no comments that I'm available or that I am aware of. And um, at this point, um, I present you the calendar as it has been shared earlier, and um, it is uh, waiting for your action and approval at this time. Hey, are there any questions for staff? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, what are the end marking period dates? Um, I'm just trying to follow this and I started to go cross out. <laughs> um, okay, the first marking period would be 814. Okay. No, that's the starting date. Uh, let me see. Let me go. Yeah, I got to find it. Yeah. 
So it is not on this calendar. No, it's on your supplemental. Yeah, calendar. we create that supplemental calendar, which I do not have with me, but it is every nine weeks. Okay. Um, so I haven't created that yet. Okay, so my curiosity was, does the, the days uh, for teacher, um, you know, professional learning or whatever. The teacher prep delay days? Yes. Or the professional development. Well, either case. one. We have both. Well, either one, I guess, okay. is, where I'm, is where my brain is going because I, you know, we're hearing from teachers, um, we're hearing from, from principals that um, there's not a, enough time in the day because, you know, I mean, that's just where we're at, at with these days, um, where they need to be able to have the ability to sit down and actually process and put together things that they need to at the end of the market period. Yes. So those three teacher prep delay days that we created and the superintendent did approve yes. are um, strategically placed during those nine-week periods so that they do have time um, to do that. Also, what we can do is on those professional development days, and we have five of them in the calendar, mm -hmm. um, we can allow time in the mornings um, for those for their principals to give them time to work okay. um, as well on lesson planning or whatever they would deem necessary at that time. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because I'm hearing from them going, we don't have enough time, and, and trust me, I get it. They, nobody has enough time yeah. at, this, at this point. Um, I just want to make sure that we hear them and we're trying to facilitate. And, and this year we them. came on very strong with our professional development days. Um, due to the number of perm substitutes that we have and sure. whatnot, not knowing that some of the challenges we've had were gonna happen. Um, so we had to regroup a little bit, but knowing that as well, um, we can adjust those morning times of those five professional development days so that okay. teachers do have more time to work with their teams or in the classrooms or lesson planning, however they deem necessary to use it. Sure. But we did also add those three teacher delay prep yes. days to help support at those nine weeks that was um, my that was good that yes. was part of my question was you know does that line up with it and, does. and it does yes that's and that perfect. was the reason for that to give them a little extra time and it does this year also right it, uh, it did this year also well we don't have those days this year we didn't have any of them i thought we, we just had one didn't we? No, that was a professional learning day we have five of those a year yeah but, that's a professional learning day we have them in this calendar but then we also created three um professional development uh, delay days okay. where teachers can use right before the nine weeks to do their grades and to plan or to use however they want to so at that time. The, so those are three, like that's two additional hours. Oh, which we did uh, on this those last, days. This, this last time we allowed them to work from home. And yes, for four hours. hours. Yes, yes, for four hours. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the concern because of the hacking problem and the accessibility sure. of schoolology and other things. Was there any way that we could, I mean, with, with enough notice to parents, give them a day next week with uh, inquiry to the state board to ask, you know, we haven't had a lot of, we haven't had any snow day. Well, we Are you saying snow. a day off? Not a day off, a day to get, get to do the work. And, but a day with no instruction with yeah, students? Yeah. I mean, that is something the superintendent, what, would have to decide with the board. I, I don't have the power to do that. Don't we have to get that proof out of state? Well, the superintendent, the one we had the where you really had to use a non, uh, what was it called, non traditional? Non traditional instructional. instructional days. So, where they go in is the uh, AIT, the accumulated instructional time by the 30 minutes. So, that's why you get the two hour early dismissal or delays. That eats into that time, so there is still some bank there that okay. he could use, maybe put a delay or something, but that would be between the board and superintendent and mm -hmm. Eric Hart and our staff to develop that. There is some extra time there that still that could I, be. I thought he told me he had to get that through That one day, because he didn't have instruction the entire day, but these he plays. He has a situation with the internet, yeah. Yeah. and it was, I think, a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I mean, some people, I know I... You wouldn't believe how long it took me to run this off at home because I could run. I, I have a picture of me doing the burning leaves with a blanket, and that's my high speed internet out there. No, I mean, it, I don't have it. I have a hotspot. I'm paying $40 a month for it. 
and it takes me forever. And this is all I got to run off today. Uh, thank you for the president's book. Otherwise, I'd be flying blind up here. And I, I just feel like that uh, what Miss Abel said tonight, uh, shared with me. If we can get a day to let them work mm -hmm. and give the parents a chance to make arrangements, uh, I don't think they need it. I think even if we gave them a half day, an early dismissal, an early dismissal or a late day, but to ask parents to, I don't know what the answer is. When is that? When would that be? Another report part. They're due the seventeenth of March. Yeah, that's, that's not next week. That's not, yes, that's not hard in this time. But... Mm -hmm. I know. I just think that if we can help them out, after I watched the debate on the PBIA and anything else, I, I'm really, and I've, I've had conversations with people in the board office about their, their concern over the same thing. I'm just worried that everything coming down, all these deadlines, all this work, People are working at night at home because they don't have the time to work in the daytime because they're covering for classes. It's, it's, I just feel like the whole system's more than. Well, I think we all do that. Yeah. We make things work from the top down. We're all doing that. I know. And, and I'm just worried um, about our And we'll continue for... to do it. Um, now, as far as the deadline for the report card, if we needed to extend that, I mean, that's something we could do if needed. Um, I have not heard that. This is, you know, the first well, one that it's been, you know, told to me. But even with that, I would have to take that to the superintendent and make sure that that is something that he wanted to do. Um, and I would support that. But as far as a day off, I, I think that would need to come from you and, and our superintendent. Well, I, I suggested extending the deadline for the report cards, but I when it was indicated that that wouldn't really be a help, they still need the time during the day to get caught up. Yeah, they, they're just, they're burning out. And it's, I'm sure you all in the board office are under the same stress because I know you're out working in the school mm -hmm. trying to help schools. So I'm mm -hmm. just, I'm just worried about the, um, the structure of the system and, and and what are we going to have next year in our classroom? Yeah, and I, I, I can tell you, you're not the only one who's yeah. gotten feedback. Uh, I've got, I had one today, I had a teacher tell me today that it's all they can do just to get to the end of the school year. My heart breaks because you can tell that their passion is there for their kids, but they, they're on empty. They're on empty, and I know when when we'd advocated for and they received that four hours at home for their professional learning, that was the, the feedback that, that I had received that of thank yous was astronomical. And I'm right there with you, Jackie. I just, I we got to do something for them. But what I don't want them to burn out and, and quit. I don't want them to, I mean, they're on empty. How can we expect them to, to give their absolute? I mean, they always do give their absolute best 100%. I think it was like Tana said, everybody's on. Everybody yeah. is. So I've got a question. I guess back to back to the calendar for a minute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that. Yeah. No, well, I, I noticed. Okay, you have the prep and delay days and the professional learning days, but I know there were some teachers that came before saying there wasn't a, a, might have been professional development days where there was not enough time because the principal would have them do all the various trainings where they also needed time to do planning things, but couldn't be done because there was too much crunched into those days where they couldn't actually get the things done that they wanted to get done. So I'm wondering, are those prep and delay days going to be enough? Okay, so I said thing? this year we went out of pretty strong on those professional learning days. And I said that next year on the professional learning days, mm -hmm. 
which there's five days that are built into the calendar, just like this year, mm -hmm. we we're going to allow a lot more flexibility at their schools in the morning during that time. We still need to do professional development countywide, like we did on the 20th, mm -hmm. um, but it would give them a little more uh, time to work in their classrooms or to plan and, and work together on those days. This year, we had it scheduled because we felt like it was so necessary with the number of substitutes that we had in our buildings and with our test scores and looking at that mm -hmm. to really try to increase student achievement, we felt like we really needed to provide and work on that professional development to really bring that rigor into the classroom so that our students were doing better. So we hit it very hard this year. With that, we've had other challenges, of course. Recently, the internet challenge, mm -hmm. um, which has created just another level of stress. Mm -hmm. So in this calendar, Looking forward, we still have those professional development days. We're looking at you allowing the morning to be used how the principal wants to use it. Whereas before we had it very structured. So the principal might have a principal's meeting and we'll say, you can have your principal's meeting, but then the rest of the morning, the teachers need to be able to do what they need to, to do to get done for the week of school or for the month of school. Then in the afternoon, and we could change the schedule, maybe we'll do ours in the morning and they have the afternoon they would have their professional development that we're working on that is our county initiative, which is gonna be rigor and co-teaching and improving those test scores and supporting students and, and teachers. And we would have those professional development hours still. Now, we don't have built-in teacher work days. And I think teachers thought that's what this was because years ago, and I was a principal for a long time, the county used to have professional development days. They did away with them and they said, this is the principal's day to do professional development in your building. So it was up to the principal. I can tell you what happened. Uh, everybody was wondering when, when are we going home early? Now we didn't have the problems we had then either. Um, and some, you know, schools let out early, some had professional development, some did it. So coming in after COVID and looking at our achievement, uh, the department decided we really need to focus on who are we, where do we want to be, and what's the most important thing we're doing and that we need to look at. Student achievement and reading a map. Okay. We have some schools with a number of permanent substitutes who are educated people, who are smart people, who've never been in a classroom. How can we make sure that those students are trained, that those teachers are trained, and our students are getting the best quality education they can? And that was through our professional development. And that's why I said we hit it really hard this year. Um, and we did. We worked really hard to provide every opportunity for those new teachers to be able to say, oh, this is how I do this. This is what is best for kids. This is what the Berkeley County School Literacy Model is. With that, we also gave them playbooks, which were just references, very short references that any person who could read could look at it and say, oh, this is a model for how my reading class should be or this is a model for how I should be teaching math. And then we focused on providing more development to build on. So that's how we are thinking this through. Um, it is a lot, um, and I'm not saying it's easy, but um, when you look at learning loss because of COVID and everything our county has gone through and other things as well, we've had, I think the last five years in education have been very challenging um, and have changed greatly. Um, this is the approach that we took. Um, and, and I feel confident that it's a positive approach. We can back off a little, but I can tell you without that professional development, with the number of perm subs we have in our buildings, we're not going to see student achievement. We're going to, we're going to raise it a little bit. Um, and we have our veteran teachers who are outstanding and are work, working very hard, but it takes everybody. And being able to, you know, collaborate and plan together is really important and they're subbing. And I understand that as well. Um, so that takes that piece away from it too. However, we do have opportunities and I know they're exhausted, but we do pay them if they wanna work after school. And a lot of principals and teams have gotten creative and will plan after school together and they get paid to do that. So they are compensated. It is a longer day and more work, but it does give them an opportunity with some compensation to do that. Um, so, so I just had another question because um, I know this gets brought up all the time 
um, it's still calendar related. Okay. Is the mandatory trainings that staff have to do. Um, so that's, that's on the safe that, and supportive yeah. schools. Or, no or website. The asking, is that usually done before the, or was that done that first week? I can't try to remember. Yes, when they were given opportunities during the first week to do it. To do all those things. Okay. Yes, but it's a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know it's a lot, true. but it's required. Those yeah, are required yeah, trainings every right. year. And we all have to do them. Yeah. I mean, everybody in the school system has to do them. And they're turned on before school even starts. Yes. So, but that is good remembrance. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We have a we have a presentation. We have any more questions about the calendar? I know we've had a lot of questions about the year, but about the calendar. Okay, I need a motion to approve the uh, graph C of the 23-24 school year. So moved. Second. Second. A motion by Ms. Power, a second by Ms. Long. Uh, discussion on the motion. All those in favor, the most signify by saying aye. Aye. There is nay. I appear to have eyes to have to clear the uh, motion to adopt the unanimous. Dr. Schooley. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, the personnel actions that you have before you this evening that are dated for Monday, March the 6th, uh, 2023, are as follows. We have six new coaching appointments. One is paid. Five of those are unpaid. Uh, we have one ratification of a suspension and termination of a coach on line eight, and that is Jennifer Baker. We have four coaching resignations, one new extra duty assignment, uh, one resignation of an extra duty assignment, three new healthcare appointments. On uh, line 18, we have a ratification of suspension termination, and that's Kathy Calkins. We have four professional resignations, uh, one revised resignations with the date that has been determined. Uh, we have seven new uh, professional retirements to qualify for the retirement bonus at the end of the year. Uh, one administrative reassignment, eight uh, service appointments, three corrections to previous uh, appointments there. And we have four changes of assignments of service personnel. We unfortunately lost one employee at Spring Mills High School uh, last month. Three resignations of service personnel, five retirements of service personnel, and only one transfer of service personnel. Uh, we have 11 new substitute service personnel to add to the list uh, with one resignation of substitutes there on the service side, six new substitute teachers to appoint, and two resignations of substitute teachers okay. for a total of 75 personnel um, actions with the superintendent's recommendation. I have a motion to approve the personnel list. Come on. Second. Second. Okay, a motion has been made by Ms. Ms. Long and second by Mr. Martin to approve the um, personnel list. Are there any questions from members of the board of Dr. School? We're losing a lot of teachers mm -hmm. with people to reach out. Um, so I'm so professional. Other comments or questions? What does timesheet mean? Uh, if it's the backup for the healthcare, they... Uh... Have been trained and they only get paid when they actually perform their duty, whether like as a substitute for giving the medication or the hygiene of the individual. There's normally someone there, but they're just trained to be backed up that individual. I think he's talking about the bus, bus run. Uh, which one? Hang on. The uh, bus run, the middays, those are not a salary position, so it's based upon their time sheets they turned in. So they're paid by the hour? Yes. Okay. Other questions? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. I screwed up and I screwed up the motion pass. Board announcements. I'm going to announce uh, that Mr. Damon uh, Wright and Ms. Long were going to work <laughs> along with Council Forum. And uh, anyone else they uh, determined to help them to develop a nepotism policy in Berkeley County uh, for future board consideration. Uh, and the other thing is, is that at the next board meeting, we have these assignments of schools, and I thought maybe before the school year is out that we switch 
I don't want to do it tonight, but uh, at the next board meeting, I want you all to be thinking about different different assignments so you can go visit those schools. I want to visit my schools before I switch once more. Okay, so at the next board meeting, you will be busy. I guess between now and then, I'll really be busy. Yeah. Okay, this is Dr. Schooley. Uh, good evening. On behalf of Mr. Stevens, uh, probably uh, the, the, his son's basketball team, Chattanooga, uh, lost this evening. Uh, so they're second in their conference. Uh, it was 88 to 79. And Jake Stevens led the way with 25 points for his team. So, so we're waiting to see if selection Saturday here, Sunday, Sunday uh, turns out for the team in the end. So, he, so his announcements that he provided to us again, we want to thank and uh, really congratulate our ACE Award, Valerie Kearns, this evening and this population or the staff at uh, Edgeville Middle for being here to help support that. Truly shows a great asset to Berkeley County Schools and our students that we have there. Also, it's Youth Art Month and students of each of the four high schools will have art on display at the Mercerly Creative Downtown Martinsburg starting on March 12th. And congrats goes out to our wrestlers that competed this past weekend at the state tournament. Uh, we had the musicians uh, perform at the WVA conference and, and then the uh, Velocity Dance Team was in Orlando, Florida at Nationals. So we had a lot of creative arts as well as sports going on this past week. Uh, Read Across America was last week. Uh, uh, we had uh, as guest speakers within our schools uh, coming in to celebrate Dr. Seuss' birthday with this. Uh, traditional uh, event that was sponsored by NEA over the years uh, and many things there. Also, you heard a little bit this evening, I believe at one time was the high school and uh, engineering science fairs that was held uh, over the weekend as well. Here you see some of our uh, high school students who recently participated in that. They are in first place in today's science fair in Charleston uh, for possibly spots of the international science fair an engineering fair in Dallas, Texas in May. And uh, the picture there, Sydney Bostic uh, on the left has already got her ticket to the National uh, Science and Engineering Fair for a second year in a row in Berkeley County, earning grand champion at the regional competition. And her project uh, was in system software engineer category. Uh, then Friday, we had uh, employee appreciation day all around, but in particular for our maintenance uh, personnel on March 3rd. So you saw some of that of our social media posts uh, there uh, for our district. And then we want to say a big thank you to these individuals that were in and out of our schools. Uh, Joe and his team do a great job of keeping everything up and running uh, for these. The department made up of carpenters, electricians, general maintenance, HVAC, and plumbers uh, to keep the buildings running. Some maintenance uh, members shared that they loved about their jobs. I love working in the school and seeing kids smiling faces and knowing that I'm part of their education and keep them safe. Another one commented, working in maintenance is a new challenge every day. And at the end of the day, I see the work I've done and can be proud. So a big thank you to the BCS maintenance team for everything that they do uh, last week. Uh, this week is uh, National School Breakfast Week and it's dig into school breakfast. So we have uh, three or four schools out there really celebrating the school breakfast. Uh, and we'll be trying some new uh, breakfast items that include strawberry pancake breakfast bowl, crustable breakfast sandwich, smoothie bowls, and more. Uh, so you never know who might appear in some of the guest serving lines this week uh, for our kids from the staff as well uh, going out there. We recognize our child nutrition department for all their hard work throughout the year. So far, they have served 1,080,360 breakfast this year alone uh, through the end of February. And, are, and so on average, they're serving 9,477 breakfasts a day to our students. Uh, and here you see some of the pictures from uh, earlier this year during school lunch week of our school cafeterias and trying to get students to participate in those programs. Uh, this week is also uh, School Social Worker Week. Uh, the School Social Work Week uh, is an opportunity for schools and communities to partner to acknowledge and recognize the impact they do to support uh, student families and their communities. Under the leadership of School Social Work Association of America, this celebration emphasizes school social work, contributes a focus on the whole 
child, linking families and community resources, a valuable voice as part of the school's multiple disciplinary team and advocating for the profession of school social work. The theme this year is We Rise. During the school year, uh, school social workers are confronted with many challenges, heightened anxieties, and anticipate difficulties. However, school social workers face these challenges with strength and resilience. School social workers rise up, supporting their families and their school communities and their students. School social workers rise to share hope. They rise to listen and understand. They rise to the challenge of inequities. They rise to support all students. So thank you uh, to our social workers out there. And then also our next regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting will be on Monday, March the 20th at Spring Mills High School. And it's the LSIC presentation to begin uh, the Spring Mills District at 5 p.m. with the regular meeting to start at 7. And thank you very much for this evening. Thank you. One of the last bit of business is I want to schedule a meeting on Sunday, uh, Sunday the 12th at one o'clock. And that meeting will be for in the superintendent's search process to develop the uh, format questions. Um, we take a preliminary view of uh, any resumes we have. We also have to take action on a late application um, and we'll do it at that meeting. Uh, and the meeting will be at one o'clock and we're going to try to schedule it at Holiday Inn in a, in a room up there. Uh, Mr. O'Call will try to make the arrangements for us up there. Are you saying you got an application for the deadline? Yeah, yeah, and we just have to take action. And, uh, so decide whether you want to accept that one? Right, right. And uh, the other thing is, is that on, uh, on Saturday, the 25th, uh, I initially was talking about the 18th, but we have to move it to the 25th. Uh, would you all be willing to spend a Saturday interviewing candidates for the superintendent? Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, yes. okay. <laughs> okay, that'll be a nine o'clock starting time uh, at the Holiday Inn. We room good to be determined. Both meetings will be at the holiday. Yes, ma'am. And uh, so we we have uh, a meeting on the twelfth at one o'clock, and that'll be uh, to develop the uh, the questions to a preliminary re review of the uh, of the uh, resumes we have and uh, applications. And also, we have to handle a later arrival, formally, um, at one of the point of rights of the council. And then on the 25th, we will schedule the candidates for the interview process. Do we have that application, or we won't get it? Get it? Uh, Mr. Uh, Spooley will send it to you. The entertain. Mm -hmm. All right. Another update I have for that is, just this, today, I received the first draft of the results of the community survey staff survey. Everything. There's a second part to that that did not come in yet. So as soon as I get both together, I will forward that out to you so that you have that to look at. Before that day. Before that day, yes. I forgot all about it. Thank you, Ms. Feather, for that. Okay, the hour is late. I'm sure you all don't want to talk about anything else. So let's have a motion to adjourn. So move it. Okay, the fight is between Ms. Ballard and Ms. Long. She can have And I'll second. Okay, all those in favor of the motion say goodbye to say night. Aye. Those nay, my Saturday. Good night. Thank you, Stan, for staying. Thank you.